the opportunity of being here today, coming from this corner up there that is covering clouds. It has been a great experience seeing something bright out there in the sky, and it has been a great experience from a scientific perspective. So today, I would like just to <coughs> drive you through a uh, something that is slightly different than all the other presentations that we haven't seen today and in the, during the last couple of days. We are, I'm going to just to introduce you about something that could be a little bit controversial and that will be nice. I would like to hear from your perspective and I'm going to give you a perspective of what is the exposomics doing for health informatics or for biomedical informatics and why we as biomedical informaticians should be a little bit more concerned about what is going in this field than we probably are. So, first of all, I would like to start with a <clears throat> brief definition about what is biomedical informatics. Biomedical informatics is an interdisciplinary field that studies and pursues the effective uses of biomedical data, information, knowledge for scientific inquiry, problem solving, and decision making motivated by the efforts to improve human health. So according to this definition, all the work that we have been seeing so far, all the aspects of the exposomics, at the end, are going to be affecting us and are going to be an important element of concern for us as biomedical informaticians because we are dealing with data, information, knowledge coming from all the platforms that we have discussed and we are concerned about what are the effects of all these chemicals, all these <coughs> environmental factors that are happening in our health. Biomedical informatics, as many other disciplines, has different flavors, right? Those different flavors can go for things that we have been discussing today from, for example, translational bioinformatics, which would be very much dealing with all the omics data to aspects related with clinical research informatics, clinical informatics, Public health informatics, obviously, it's an important element that has been addressed here already, and consumer health informatics. And we have seen and we will see that all these aspects are somehow related with the exposome. And we will be able to, during this talk, I hope I will convince you that biomedical informatics can offer something to help you in the exposomics field from these different perspectives and also that we have lots of things to learn from what is going on in the field to apply in these different, con in these different areas. Something that was <coughs> sort of a paradigm for biomedical informatics was the way we structure information. For us, for, for a long time, we were just thinking about the information coming from different levels. We had the lower levels at the molecular level, we got lots of information. Omics revolution has made a lot of work in this area. And then we, wait, we went all the way up through cells, tissues, organs, individuals, and population. So we have experience on dealing with all these levels of information. And we have developed lots of application solutions trying to deal with all these elements. So this was the perspective before we started considering the exposome. So we will see <coughs> later on the <coughs> that all these things do have an impact for our discipline. What is in a name, right? We have been talking lots today and in the last, yesterday as well, about this sort of formula here, the phenotype is coming from the interactions between the genome and the environment, right? We have things here, and this is just an example about what things may look like. We have what might look like a nice picture of someone just riding a horse. Actually, this is just a phenotype. So it's something that we have, someone who has got this kind of tan tattoo and has got this different responses there, so we can see this figure. So we are seeing that depending on this UV exposure, we have changed this phenotype. During this, <coughs> as I said before, during 
all these sessions, we have been discussing about omics, we have been discussing about the genotypes, but maybe it could be interesting for us just to go back a little bit, trying to figure out when all these terms that we are using were coined and where are they coming from. Firstly, the genotype was coined a little bit more than a uh, hundred years ago, 1903 by <coughs> a Swedish scientist, Wilhelm Johansson, who just coined the, the term uh, genotype. And by that time, this term was controversial. So we have a definition that is that the genetic makeup of an organism and group of organisms with the same constitution. So this idea is that we can now generate genotypes. And actually, for many years, at least uh, in health informatics, we have been saying that we are going to generate the systems that are going to allow us, and we have them, to incorporate genotypes into our clinical records. And we have that, we are using them, and we are happy with that. We also have phenotypes. We have been discussing a lot about them, and it's something that we are all used to, to use in the context of the exposome. We are using that, we are saying that the, exp the, the phenotype is affected by the environmental factors, so we can link this element back to the genotype. It was coined as well in a little bit later than uh, the genotype by Johansson as well, and it was in 1912. And again, it's the type of phenomenon that actually appears. So it's sort of a consequence, or at least when it was coined, it was coined as a consequence about what was happening with the genome. But we have been keep working on it. So what is what we have done? Well, for a long time, we started defining what the, were the genotypes. We were able to generate the human genome, and now we are just routinely phenotyping people. Similarly, we coined the term phenotype. We can argue whether we do have a phenome, but the, the term phenome and the phenome is being used regularly in the literature, and we are very good at phenotyping. Actually, in health informatics, phenotyping is something that we regularly use extracting information from the clinical records. But what happens when we come to the term of the, to the area of the exposome? We first define the exposome as the whole set of, ex of exposures, but when we try to define the exposures, yes, we call them exposures. Can we just represent them somehow as we did with the, with the genotypes? We can say that this patient has this genotype for this gene, for this position, it could be one of the four letters. But though, what do we have when we talk about the exposome? We have an exposure to something. We may be even going to further detail and we can provide some ideas about when it was or what was the magnitude of this exposure. But still, we are just talking about exposures. And then we come to exposome. But when we generate the element, when we assess what is the exposome, how are we calling it? Are we calling it just generating exposomes? Or should we use something else? So coming from this idea, a colleague of mine, Professor Martin Sanchez, and myself, we decided just try to coin a new word. It's just like something that we all want to do, we always do, and we come with this idea of the expotype. And the expotype will come just to fill this gap here in the back is how can we just try to generate all these ideas, all this set of exposures? Can we try to organize them somehow? Can we just try to give them a structure? And we came with this idea. We define it, and this is open for discussion. I would love to hear from all of you about how we can refine this, this, this concept, but it's just the specific set of exposome elements of an individual that are accumulated during a certain time or space relating to a particular phenotype. And then we can use the word and the term expotyping as the process to determine expotypes. So we can extract all this information and we can use it. And, we <clears throat> and during the rest of the presentation, I will give you some ideas about how we can just try to address all this process of expotyping. 
As I said, this is our idea, this was our vision, we published it, so someone else sort of agreed with us, at least three people agreed with us, and we were happy. We are aware that this can be controversial, and <clears throat> not saying that we are at the same level that, as Johansson did, but this is just a couple of examples about how controversial the idea of the genotypes and the phenotypes was 100 years ago. There were lots of scientists complaining, saying that the genotype was something different, and the idea of trying to call something a genotype was a scientific aberration. Again, here we have the transference of the term genotype and the change of its meaning is not desirable. So with this, I hope that somehow I have convinced you that we can generate expotypes and we can all be expotyped and we can have these expotypes. So how can we, from the biomedical informatics side, contribute other than presenting some of the wonderful analytical methods that have been shown already around here to this process of expotyping? Well, there are lots of ways we can try to do that, and there are lots of people here who have been already doing this, much better than I can say. So we can try to extract information from general exposure databases or other sources. Those could be these big chunks of coal, and the advantage we have from this, from this approach is that we have a myriad of resources that might be really interesting. This morning there was a, <clears throat> In one of the presentations, there was a slide that showed that there were like 114 different databases that could be interesting for the development of a blood exposome database. So that's just to give you an idea about how many things we do have. Drawbacks we have trying to do this is that it's difficult for us and it's difficult to connect the contents from these resources with individuals. If we are thinking about generating expo types, we are thinking about what kind of exposures we did individually have. So how can we do this? This information may give us ideas. This information may help us to combine it with other data sources, like, for example, the use of mobiles and other sensors that may give us an idea about where and when we were, and then we can link and relate with this information. And the hope we have to really use is that actually public health and many people here have been using these settings and they have proved that it's successful and this can be applied. We have another way just to generate expotypes and it's just going to experimental procedures. We have been seeing in different talks during this meeting how we can use non-targeted approaches, just trying to identify what are the metabolites that can be associated with different exposures, how we can identify biomarkers that we can relate with different exposures. So this is something that is actually happen, happening, and this is something that is enriching us. We can associate all these things. These analyses are going to be individual, and it's very good, and we can use it. However, at the moment, this is still costly, although this could be arguable, and it's complex to implement at a population scale. However, technology is reducing cost, and there is an increasing number of projects that are pushing these boundaries and are just actually getting closer to that. Something else that is quite important is that nowadays we are all carrying all sort of sensors around us with us in our pockets. Mobile phones, different wearables, all these technologies are actually <clears throat> a real gate to access and capture exposome data. We have these things. We are capturing to what we are exposed at all times. However, if we try to do this at individual level, uh, at individual level, at, citi at citizen level, we have a problem that is that we are going to be dealing probably with consumer grade devices. And they can be noisy, they can be capturing information in a way that is inconsistent. They could be scattered around in different formats, locations, and eventually sometimes we may not have direct access to our data. We need to request for some of the companies who are just capturing this data to give us our data back. So these are 
issues that are around there and may, yes, hindrance the application of these approaches. However, as a way to have uh, some options about this, is that we have some initiatives just trying to make sense of this data. We have initiatives, initiatives trying to standardize how we can capture or share this data, and that's important. And this would be these smaller, tiny pieces of fuel that may help us in, in our research approaches. Another resource that is very important and that has been discussed here before a couple of times is the use of electronic health records. It is a rich potential data source for us. The benefits that we have using uh, electronic health record is that we have an order history and we have the information that we have there. It's link directly with some phenotypes that might be of interest, particularly in the context of health. It might be linked with some interventions that we are just interested in. And it provides us as well some sort of information about the genomics and the genetics in form of the family history that we are collecting in here. The drawbacks associated with the use of uh, <coughs> The clinical records or the electronic health records for the analyzing the expo types is that we are just talking about the snapshots. So we just go to the doctor now and then, hopefully more then than now. And <clears throat> these data, as I said before, it's usually the, considered by many of us like a gold mine to mine. But actually, the data, when you start dealing with clinical records, it's going to be noise, it's going to be inconsistently captured in terms of uh, elements related with environmental factors and exposures and things like that. And sometimes, if we are able to capture it, most likely it's going to be in the form of a free text as a clinical note and things like that. And that's going to make it more difficult for us to mine it later on. However, we also have good news in the use uh, related with the application, the potential application of clinical records, and is that we have potential elements that are encoded there, and we have many elements that could be surrogates and that are already encoded and systematically accessed. For example, we have infections, we can track them, we have uh, access to drug prescriptions, and we can use all these sources as an important element for the development of expotypes, or at least what we could define as clinical expotypes. So at the end, what we are going to have is this sort of combination of big data using these multi-omics appro approaches where we generate huge amount of data, big data sets that are collected by environmental protection agencies, et cetera, et cetera, small data that we are just collecting from all the, <coughs> uh, the citizen science approaches, et cetera, et cetera. But what we have to think is that this is just when we think about just trying to generate one expo type. But this is, this is what is going to be the reality when we bring all these things together. We are going to be overwhelmed with data. So it's going to be very important for us, as it happened with genomics, just trying to probably define those expo types and then decide which are the variables that are going to be more informative and which are the ones that we are not going to be requiring that often. So that's something that we have to consider. At the end, one of the ideas would be just trying to link all these elements into the clinical record. So we could have access to exposome data or expo types. We can extract information and put information in. We will have, or we have information about our genomes, or at least about our genotypes, and then obviously we will have all this information. But something that is going to be very important is what we have been doing and what we have been just trying to promote from the biomedical informatics area is that we need not only to generate these things, which is going to be very good for, hopefully, the management of patients, but also just trying to generate this big biomedical research data repositories that are going to help us to actually define and refine what are the expo types and what is the information that we need to keep here, because maybe we do not need everything 
Otherwise, we will be overwhelming the systems. So that's something that is important. As I said, it's, we believe that it's possible to generate these exprototypes, but something that is important for us is how we can capture this information, how we can represent this information. From a biomedical informatics perspective, we have been using knowledge representation tools and standards for almost ever. These tools have the big potential and the big capacity of giving us the means to be interoperable, to share information, to facilitate as well information retrieval if we are able to encode or to use something that is clearly accepted by the community, we are going to be able to share it and we are going to retrieve it more, more easily. And these tools have been implemented in different resources. So I don't know how many of you here know about, for example, the gene ontology. That's a paradigmatic example here. But we have lots of other knowledge representation tools that are extremely useful. Something else that has been discussed here is this snow white quote is, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the first of them all. We have been discussing lots about what is the relevance of sharing this data and how we can follow these fair principles. Make things and make our research and findings findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Making them findable, it's something that we are using. Making them accessible, we have database where we can access it. Reusable, well, we can reuse data from the databases, that's easier, but making them interoperable is still uh, some, somehow, I think it's still one of the roadblocks that we are seeing here. How we can just make this information shareable in a unified and interpretable way. And the importance is that we should be extremely concerned about how we are capturing all this metadata and how we are capturing all these elements because we just want to make it formal and something that is very important, we want to make all this information and all this knowledge that we are generating interpretable by both machines and humans because as I said before, we are generating huge amounts of, of data and we certainly need to have this data interpreted, interpreted by machines. But if we plan at some time, and we have been discussing this during this meeting, to implement this for clinical practice, we need clinicians to have access to this information and to be able to understand it. So as I said before, ontologies have improved as a very important tool for interoperability. And they have been used lots of times before in different areas and multiple environments. And they help us to capture and annotate both data and metadata. So what happened in the area of the exposome? We have lots of information. We have lots of things that are going on. But how can we represent this data? Do we have any unified, accepted, uh, formal knowledge representation tool that is capturing this, this area? Do we have something that is being used in the different repositories? So with those questions in mind, uh, four years ago, we just tried to check which were some of the recommendations from some major data repositories like Array Express, EGA, the Gene Expression Omnibus, or the database for genotypes and phenotypes. And what are the recommendations for representing the data and capturing the data? We have ontologies to capture the phenom. We have ontologies to capture the genome aspects. But when we come to the exposome, there are tools, but none of them were recommended except EFO, which is the experimental factors ontology to be used in Array Express. But that was all. So what happens in, in this analysis? DBGAP should be somewhere that we are very much interested in mining and analyzing because we are linking phenotypes and genotypes. And we know that environmental factors are going to play a role there. So how are we capturing all that information? Can we just try to extract it? So 
we just were interested in just trying to analyze and investigate this. And by the time, we just considered using two of the most relevant ontologies that were developed for capturing these areas. One was EXO, the Exposons ontology, and the other one is the Fenex tool that was developed here in the US. To match of our disappointment, we tried to match uh, ex EXO results and EXO concepts with the knowledge uh, that were contained in the description of dbGaP, and we did not succeed. We did not get any stride match with these contents. We had a little bit more luck using, the, using Fenex, so we extracted dbGaP study variables. We got from Fenex the automatic and manual extraction of what were environmental and exposome terms, and then we just tried to do a term matching to identify them. In this case, we were a little bit more lucky. We just identified that almost one third of the studies that we have in dbGaP were returning something that we could map back to Phoenix. This is great. The disappointment comes when the elements that we were thinking were, most about, were mostly related just with smoking or alcohol drinking. So at the end, it's just like we still have a lot of work to do. With this in mind, the next stage was, OK, let's see what's going on in the literature. Let's try to characterize a little bit what is going on on the exposome from the literature perspective. So something that was very similar to the <coughs> work presented this morning, we used some text mining analysis of the, of the literature, and we used just yes, two different approaches. One was an inductive analysis, followed by topic modeling analysis, and identifying a series of topics that were relevant in the exposome literature, and then we use a deductive analysis just trying to identify which of the existing ontologies that we have can be recommended to represent the knowledge that we have, that we are publishing around the exposome area. And with this, we came with this series of terms. So we ran this a couple of times, first with the literature up to 2016, then we repeat the analysis with the literature up to 2018, and we found things that it's what we would expect. So broad terminologies or ontologies like NCAT, SNOW, MEDCT, MESH, LOINC are appearing here. But those are broad terms. And in some cases, there are even problems when we are identifying terms, things here. Because for example, in, law in, in the NCAT, we have this lead and lead difference one as a metal and the other one as a verb. And the one that we are identifying in the NCIT was the verb rather than the metal. So that's, these this, this ambiguation problems are still a problem. In, 20, in 2018, we just found that there were a couple of new kids on the block that looked very promising, particularly cheer, which was uh, very highly ranked in, in our analysis and was just very good at describing most of the publications that we have. So I think that this is something that is very important and it's a great work that should, we should be keeping working on because this is the kind of tools that are going to help us to collaborate. Regarding the different uh, topics, what we could identify was, were this list of 25 different topics that had different elements here, and we were able to identify some of the things that have, in the, for example, for this topic 13, we have identified many of the topics that are, we have been discussing and we have been talking about during this, uh, during this meeting. We have omics, health, chronic diseases, air pollution, urban environment, cheer, microbiome, the European projects, and all those things. And we have the other 24 elements, and some of them were more focused on particular aspects related, for example, with air pollution and just capturing 
information that was related with air pollution, some others were more related with the age of, uh, age of the patients and things like that, and age of the involved in the studies. So with this, the next stage is just like, okay, from what we are and where we are right now, what kind of information do we have in the EHRs that could be low-hanging fruit? Because this is an area that we can exploit relatively easily. And we have these line codes, and the good thing we have from there is that they can, we can use them because they are capturing lots of information coming from different places. For example, we have aspects that cover from toxicology to social determinants of health. Just from the toxicology aspect, we, can, we have more than 8,000 codes that are covering there. And the good thing is that we not only have these unified results that, we're, that we can mine. Loin codes are used across the globe in different systems. They have been translated to different languages, and they are very easily to, trans, to transmit and to share using something that is standardized in the health informatics area that is HL7. So, a different approach was just trying to mine clinical records and link them to ontologies. And <clears throat> some concepts that were mapped in the UMLS, and this was a work developed by, uh, published by Fan et al. in 2017. And in this case, the problem is that we were just focusing on the ontologies that we have. So that was sort of a problem. Just before I wrap up, I would like to bring up the concept of how exposome and participatory health to work together. And it's very important for us in biomedical informatics just to help and provide tools for participatory health to capture all this information. The problem is that we are dealing with self-monitoring examples and self-monitoring uh, for expo typing creates new problems, that is new data types, new data sources that are going to be changing as, as fast as we generate new, uh, new sensors. And then we also have all problems related with the standardization, data integration, and data sharing, et cetera, et cetera. So as I'm running out of time, I will just wrap, jump quite a few things just to show you that we develop what we define as the minimal information about the self-monitoring experiment that is a tool, a reporting guideline that help us to, to interpret how we are just conducting this self-monitoring experiment. So it's important to know where we are, where in a sensor, and that's important just to share it. If we think about, for example, what has been happening with the use of Fitbit, we have lots of papers that are just describing these things, but we struggle just to find the reproduce the elements that may that may help us to reproduce them, understanding what kind of Fitbit, what version of the firmware they were using, and all these elements that are really important just for doing longitudinal analysis and meta-analysis later on in the future. Finally, one last thing I would like to discuss is the digital exposome and the concept that we have a digital component of the exposome. We have defined a digital phenotype, and that's the list of breadcrumbs we leave on our digital life. And we can also define the digital component of the exposome, and that is how the digital exposures, how we interact with the digital environment is actually having an effect on us. This may, be, this may sound a little bit far-fetched, we did a work in the, in the past using social media, and we saw that using different social media just improved the outcome in patients suffering of chronic pain. But there are some other examples, like the use of drugs and clinical trials, and we have other drugs that we can use. And is that we can see that there can be addictions, but we also have that we can use, for example, virtual, ex virtual reality as a treatment for certain conditions. So that's a clear, in a clear example of how a digital experience is actually modifying our phenotype. At the end, what we have is this sort of Moebius strip where we do not know 
when a digital phenotype is transforming into a digital expotype, and sometimes where the digital, uh, where the genotype is leading to a disease or where is the phenotype. We are just moving on one side or the other, and this is just a one health condition. So just to conclude, would like to say that exposome data is actually reshaping biomedical informatics. We are starting to forget about these information levels that we discussed, and we have these three layers, or these three components, phenom, genome, and exposome, and we have the biomedical information in the middle that is just flowing from one place to another. The exposome probably is nowadays, and this has been repeated lots of time already, in the same place as genomics was 20 years ago or something like that, or even farther apart, but we have experiences about what we did with genomics, and we can use them, try to learn and prevent some of the, some of the problems that we are facing now with the exposomics. So this is the iceberg we are seeing, and this is us just trying to collect this, but even how daunting the task might be, I think it's worth exploring. Just would like to acknowledge some of my collaborators, and if you have any questions, please ask to the Salmon of Knowledge, rather than myself. This is from uh, Belfast. Thanks a lot for your attention, and if you have any questions, 